a four-door coupe at the S-Class level. Oh, wow. So that's something that was, was discussed. Uh, we looked at a model. Uh, it, of course, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Yes. And, and it's one of those where every car person in the room would say, Jesus, can we figure this out? And then you start doing the math. Yeah. The, the math says that would have been a very difficult car to make, uh, to, to, to make it work. Product management, some people call it product planning, it is essentially cultivating the, the product portfolio that exists with your manufacturer. For us, obviously, that's, that's Mercedes-Benz. So we cultivate the product portfolio into what works best for our market. Um, and so it's really, it's picking and choosing what models make sense, be it engines, uh, body styles, and then it even goes to, it could be color, interior, exterior, and optional equipment. And so it's our job to really, and probably the, one of the hardest things of product management is separating your own personal taste from what the market really likes. And so the, 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 the challenge there is, hey, I don't like this color, or I like that color. It really needs to be, what is the market like? And so you spend a lot of time doing market research, just trying to understand what are the customer preferences, what, uh, what's out there competitively, uh, what works, what doesn't work. And so you have an opportunity there to say, okay, I want to bring these cars and, and that's going to be the portfolio. Now, of course, a lot of that is defined when you walk into the job. So as a new product manager, you're looking to say, where are new opportunities and maybe what's on the horizon, what's developing, uh, what's a new trend that perhaps we can take advantage of. Now, we talked about your skill set being you are a CPA. You're a yeah. car guy CPA. <laughs> many, many account. years ago. I mean, that's a weird background. How does that fit with a product management or product planning? Because most car people who are not in the industry, mm -hmm. they think you got to be an engineer, a designer, something mechanical. Ultimately, as much as us, you know, our passionate, uh, the passionate car side of us, you got to sell the car. Uh, so understanding the numbers and the economics behind a car are huge. And because one of the things I've learned as I've mixed product and sales now is. Um, you can't be successful without a great product. It's the number one thing that matters. Mm -hmm. you, you will not be successful without a great product. But the great product is step one of 15 in order to bring it to market and be successful as a brand. What are three other steps? Oh, gosh, hey, well, marketing is a huge part of it. Uh, is your brand relevant? Uh, you know, there's the, the certification side of it. You know, you can have a great car, but if you can't get this, this, or this done, or you don't know the rules of bringing it to market, it's a problem. Um, what's your dealer network look like? How are you going to sell the car? Um, there's all the, you know, a lot of people talk about direct selling these days, and Tesla does that to a certain degree. Um, but it, it's where, where is your outlet for how are you going to sell it? So and does that fall under the purview of the product planner to take into account all of those parameters? It, it not always, but it makes the product planner better if they understand those those aspects of it. So it's a lot more market research that goes into understanding what color is available I on a car at a specific market. Yeah, yeah, those are the fun parts of it, no no doubt about it. Yeah. But understanding the sales channel, uh, what is your, what? It, how do people interpret your brand? Um, there, there's just, and, and obviously the competitive environment. And, and those are the, the big things that can influence you mm -hmm. and I think can make you a little more successful and can really make the difference rather than just saying, I know I've got the five best colors, I know I've got the best engine, and I've got the stickiest tires. Uh, you know, those are the cool, fun things. But at the end of the day, uh, who's buying your car? Do they want those things? Mm -hmm. And I think, and how are you going to get it to them? I think that's the things that not everybody thinks about. So most people would think that I kind of plan to have a potpourri of Mercedes <laughs> Benz here for your visit. And, up and I appreciate that. <laughs> very kind of me, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Up here in, in Moto Man Studio North. That's, yes. that's here in Canada. Yeah, beautiful uh, place. Bu uh, stunning and, place. And all the right smells. I walked in here, it's tires and oil, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I'm a giver, right? Yeah, now. yeah. Uh, but what people don't know is they see the classic 560, the R107 behind us. We got a 2.316 mm. Cosworth out there. But we also arranged to have that um, GT53, uh, very courtesy yep. of Kennedy, Mercedes-Benz Canada. How long does it take to bring that to market from the product planner point of view? You know, something like that, let's say the AMG GT uh, four-door, that was, uh, that's probably, we, we learn about a car like that three to f probably four years before uh, it hits the ground here. Uh, it gets tabled. It's one of those things we, it, it comes up in Germany. And the nice thing about North America, uh, we have a seat at the table because for a car, any of these performance cars, we're a customer. huge market. Uh, so you get a big seat at the table. 
And so that's a really nice, fun thing to do because it means you're brought in early uh, on, on, okay, what could the, what's the product definition? What does it look like? Um, you know, what, what do the engines look like? What's the performance envelope that we think we need to be successful? What's the competitive set? And so that's a car where w we love to have influence because AMG is such a big part of our portfolio. Um, and specifically, Canada is one of the largest AMG shares in the world. So we, we do very well with those cars. And because of that, like I said, we get a seat at the table and they want to know what what is what is Canada, what does USA think about those cars? So when you say a seat at the table, whether it's product planning, Canada, US or Korea, does every single car come that they that they bring you to the table for come to production? Uh no. Uh, so we, they we, might throw an idea yep, past you absolutely. and it gets shot down. Absolutely. There are Give cars that don't of a, make of a, it. Of a concept that got shot down. Gosh, you know, we, we talked about uh, a four-door coupe at the S-Class level. Oh, wow. So that's something that was, was discussed. Uh, we looked at a model. Uh, it, of course, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Yes. And, and it's one of those where every car person in the room would say, Jesus, can we figure this out? And then you start doing the math. And you really, and that's where it gets what hard. What did the math tell you? The, the math says that would have been a very difficult car to make, uh, to 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 make it work, uh, because there's Meaning not sell them. to sell them and make money to make money on a car like that. I mean, there aren't enough people and that are going to buy a brown diesel station wagon with a manual manual transmission. Yeah, with roll up windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's I, I would say as I've developed as a product person at heart. Uh, my tastes have have developed also in understanding what it really takes to get there and as yeah. much as you want a car and you know sometimes uh, you know sometimes you just push through and and they bring cars hey I think about you know I used to hear the stories um, and I wasn't quite in the at the level I'm at now when then the CLS first showed up on the table uh, but that's a car where yeah yeah that that's a car where emotion led the decision and and it worked um, and the and man, it pencils. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it pencils maybe, and it turns out it's even better than they think. And, and did uh, this exceed expectations? Yeah. I, I, it's, if you think about it, especially, gosh, this, it was the first of the, it really started a trend. Uh, oh, I think the first CLS, it. the first CLS was, I, I mean, it, it was like a UFO that landed. Mm -hmm. And I remember <laughs> when those things, and of course, USA and, and Canada, really North America, that's a car where we go crazy for. Um, and I remember launching it when I was in the U.S. It only had an eight-cylinder engine, we, it, and it only even had rear-wheel drive. Yet we sold every one we could sell, uh, couldn't get more, couldn't, you know, the price couldn't go up fast enough. You know, the economics of it were, were, were those kind of things don't happen often. Okay, let's look at the, the other direction. Mm -hmm. Explain to me how a CLA 250 mm -hmm. and a two, what is it, the A220 exist mm -hmm. in, the, in the same market. Yeah, well, they they won't for much longer. Well, that we know. As you, as that we know. How did that even come to being? Where you have these two practically mirror vehicles? Yeah. In the same market. Coming to a a, a product thing that I like to say is, and I and I say this because it's my mother, or it could be my dad. But could your mother or dad tell the difference? No. And, and if they can't, then you need to ask yourself as a product person: Have you really done the differentiation to the level you need to? Um, so we even even to the extent we used to call it Bart's mom's test or Bart's Bart's grandfather's test. Does it pass the test when you look at it and you say, yeah, they're clearly different? Um, they don't always. And and well, I the think proportions work in the E class size car because that's an E yeah, class for underneath sure. and yeah. the CLS. It doesn't work when you have a short short proportions. Yeah, and I think what we had to look at is okay, what's the opportunity? And I think it's also a car that depending upon the market you're in can work. Uh, you know, you think about a CLA, they have a shooting brake in Europe. Th that's a car we looked at for, for was, us. Yeah, I mean, Nat, hey, and, and you again, have failed me for not bringing <laughs> that. I thought you loved me and you yeah. don't. L yeah, it looks good. Interesting car. Uh, unfortunately, our market would have been extremely tough for a car like that. Okay, uh, this is where I want to... So, and sorry, I've gotten off topic. but well, No, this is, but this is a good topic. Yeah. Because I would argue, not argue, I have the, I have the numbers, man, and mm -hmm. you're a numbers guy. You cannot build enough Hundred and fifty thousand dollar six hundred horsepower station wagon. Yeah. <laughs> and let's be honest, it's not an attractive car. But it's purposely beautiful. Well it, it, and it's damn unique. It's damn unique, exactly. Yeah, and Imagine if you had the same thing with the proportions of a CLS wagon. How the hell could you not sell that in the US? Yeah, well, it, it's uh it, you know, it, it well and I'll tell you this. It also there's a math equation there too. For more money. Well, I, you'd, you'd be surprised. There's also, 
Um, it, it's interesting because you then say, okay, how does that affect my e-wagon? Do I need both? Can I really get away with it? Oh, so you can cannibalize the sales. It, it could be. And if you're selling one for another, you also, uh, certain cars, when they know it won't be, maybe if, if, if it's not a likely candidate for North America, yeah. maybe it's built with different certification in mind, and you might have to spend millions of dollars to say, oh, you want it for North America, and then so it becomes a different equation. Expensive. Yeah. And then it then it's like totally out of the question. So serious inside baseball kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, it, it gets it gets tough and uh, fun to look at, and forbidden fruit in twenty five years. Okay, so somewhat related to that, mm-hmm. we're seeing this weird market right now where your e wagon, one hundred and twenty five to one hundred and fifty grand, and they're going over sticker, and mm-hmm. you can't build enough. Yeah, RS six, twenty five fifty over Same sticker, story. can't build enough. Yeah, uh, Porsche. Either the cross turismo or the sport turismo, yeah. either one, electric or gas, 150 plus, mm-hmm. easily get a 200, can't build enough. Yeah. Do you think you guys missed it on, on this market? Because that's hey. crazy numbers, <laughs> yeah. and the volume clearly isn't enough for the demand. Yeah, it's crazy. You would have had to have a really good crystal ball four years ago. And that's, that's the, and what you can only hope for in both sales and product is you get it right most of the time. Mm. And uh, had we known, no one could have imagined. I remember George going into COVID and when we started doing sales scenarios, uh, we thought it was the end of the world. And I think everyone did. And, you know, and the chain of events that that caused, whether it's semiconductor suppliers or the whole, uh, the, the, whole logistic sh- uh, the whole logistics and supply chain were completely upset. And, and quite frankly, I think everyone thought it was going to be a lot worse than it was. And, I don't, and I'm not talking about COVID as it is, because that was a terrible thing, obviously. But I think everyone thought the economy was in for a, a, a nightmare. And so we went, and I'm probably everybody's the same, we went through 20, 30 different scenarios where we'd go through full charts with lines that told you exactly what you were going to sell. And everyone was wrong because the the demand was, I don't think anyone accounted for, wow, people are going to be staying at home. Uh, They can't take trips. They can't go to restaurants. They can't have fun. And now they have money. And all of a sudden they're showing up at our dealerships and paying cash for cars in droves. And uh, no one could have known that uh, n- four years ago. Heck, we didn't know it in, in, I'll tell you, in April and May and June of 2020, mm-hmm. no one in their wildest dreams could have thought that we'd be in a market that we're in now where, you know, I think most manufacturers were used to having a few more cars than customers. And now for two years and probably another year, we have more customers than cars. From the product planning point of view, do you guys see yourself taking a lesson from this and saying, this is a nice problem for us to have. It increases our transaction uh, prices per transaction. We want to keep it this way and lower the supply. Is that well, something you're going to do? It, it, it is something, and, and it, you, you can go online, you see this. It's something we've talked about from a brand perspective. We do see Mercedes-Benz shifting a bit um, and towards more where supply is a little bit more limited. I, I think it's obviously somewhere between where where the car business was maybe three, four years ago and where we might be, I don't know, a year or two from now. Um, but there's a better balance there for sure, and it does create opportunities. So somewhat related to that, about 10 years ago, you, BMW, and Audi with the A3, you all kind of had this race to the bottom where you want, at least you brought lower price cars to North America. Mm-hmm. And the idea was a Mercedes or an Audi or a BMW was more accessible. It's 29.9 was always mm-hmm. the price that came out first. Then they went up to 33, then they went up to 35. Now they're like 40 grand. Yeah. It, it, are you guys getting away from that? Yeah, I, I think definitely we, we've seen, and it's been a really a shift of our brand focus to move from, uh, I think there was always this uh, desire to be number one. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that really meant something. It was like there was a scoreboard somewhere, but quite frankly, no one knew why. I, I mean, w- we know why. Yes, we think that's from a global positioning to be number one was something to us. But if you asked a consumer, that was not their concern. They just wanted to have a great car. So I think what we've seen is the focus of our brand will be away from are you the number one seller this month? It will be are you the number one brand? And what does that brand mean? And it's an aspirational thing. And, and just because we might not have a car, uh, for every uh, income level, we want to have a car where everyone has a desire for it. And I think that's the most important thing in developing a brand. Not everyone has a Rolex watch or a Louis Vuitton, but, but they might want one. So was the lesson out of this whole experiment of going 
closer to the lower end of the market, you want to make more expensive cars or you want to make less per car. I mean, I say make less per car, meaning less numbers of cars each year, not less dollars. Or are you trying to fo follow like a Ferrari model where they always make one less than they can sell? Yeah, hey, I, you know, the, the one less than you can sell can work in a lot of different levels. And I think that that's one where I, I, I really like it. I and mean, we, we kind of call it having a, f having a few more customers than cars. And I think that's a, that's a safer model. I think it's a more financially, you know, on my CPA side, th that's the better model yeah. for Mercedes-Benz. Because uh, granted, uh, Mercedes-Benz, what we do to make a car is by definition not the cheapest way. And it never will be. So if you get into the, the point where you're chasing volume, yeah. you're getting into a race that with, with brands that build cars very differently than we do. Not to say they're wrong how they do it, but we have a purpose to how we do it. And it, and it doesn't fit very well with trying to be, uh, sell the last car to the last person. So true or false, does it cost the same to develop a volume crossover as opposed to a a Mercedes-Benz crossover. Like think GLC to a Nissan Rogue. Yeah. The, I'm talking from the Highline program cost. Yeah, it, it, that's it's a great question uh, I, because I I don't you know I don't have the insights as to Nissan, but knowing what I know about Mercedes-Benz, I know there are things we could probably do cheaper, mm -hmm. um, substantially so, but we choose not to because it would take away from the experience in the car. Uh, we could have less technology. We could have w we have cars that pass safety standards that only we have. Uh, they're not just the minimum of what maybe government says, but yeah. we're dropping cars on their roof and we're doing things that you know n no one asks us to do. But we feel like, hey, this is probably the right thing to do. So you don't know if the volume car manufacturer, the cost of their total new car development program, is similar to the cost of your total new car development program. I have to think ours is probably more expensive. By a little bit or by orders of magnitude? By a, by a, a fair amount. Interesting. <laughs> and, and I say that also because we choose to develop cars specifically, and we're going to build X number of GLCs, whereas another brand, and, and again, nothing wrong with that because they're building for a different socioeconomic position. Yeah. And they're also going to build millions of them. Uh, so there's probably economies of scale and maybe some shortcuts that you have to take just to be able to produce a car in that kind of volume. What we're doing is we know we can take a little more time to build a car. We know we can uh, put more into it, whether it's raw materials, technology, all those types of things, because we're also building for a different customer. So hell yeah, it's going to cost more because I'm asking a customer to spend 50, 60, $70,000 on a car. They should get something for that money. Whereas if I'm asking someone to spend 30 or 40 grand, they have a different set of expectations. And, and I think that's perfectly okay. You know, the, the job of an OEM is to build a car that meets uh, the expectations of their customers. And a Mercedes customer has different expectations. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the job of the product planner. What are the three biggest challenges a product planner faces? Forget about whether it's US, Canada, Germany, mm -hmm. or Japan. What are the three biggest challenges? First thing, know your customer. Who's, who's gonna buy your car? And I think that's the, that's the most important thing because you've got to understand that very well and understand that they may be very different than you personally. And because and I've seen that a lot. It's, it's like a lot of people try to put themselves into the seat of the customer and, and it, it ju they just may be different. I than think you. I would be the worst product it, it, it's, it's it, it can be incredibly difficult. And sometimes the more passionate you are, yeah. the harder it is to body shift into, okay, I would be the driver for this car or this car. Um, you know, I, I, I used to laugh about it because I'd look at the average household income of uh, an S Coupe. It's about a million bucks. I'm not that guy, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, I aspire to be. Uh, or I'm not that guy or girl, let's be honest. But Does that impact the hiring? Because, I mean, you've run the whole department yeah. in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you look for people who are, like, who who push pencils and, like, eat paste and, yeah, no, and no, drive hey, white crossovers? You know what? It, it absolutely, it, the, the passion, you can shape the passion because you can't teach it. Uh, no, I can't. I can't teach give a shit. 
And so I, 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 I want... That's his Alabama side. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. I, I want people who are passionate because then you can teach the other things. And uh, so it, it's, it's great to have that passion. It also makes it more fun. Um, like uh, things stick in your head better. You, when you give a presentation, you know the horsepower because you heard it once and you don't have to study it. Yeah. Um, so I think it helps to have that and then you, you teach the rest. So that's probably the first thing is just understanding your customer and how they could be very different than you. Okay. Um, okay. I think uh, the next thing probably... Next, you two more to do. Yeah. So next thing is really understanding what's your competitive set. So what am I going against? What do my customers... Uh, now that I know my customer, what also... What are they shopping for out there? Um, w you know, what am I going up against? How do I know that my car is competitive? How do I know that it's better? Where are the shortcomings? Where, you know, pros and cons, how do I stack up against what's out there? Um, and, and then I think, the, the, you know, gosh, if I think know your customer, uh, what's going on with the competition is the, the third one that probably is the hardest and it's one I've gained probably the best perspective of is understanding the sales channel. And because what does that involve? Like the sales people or the makeup of different markets? Like the uh, southeast market is different than yeah, the northwest. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of all of that. So w what's your market? What, so that looking at the sales channel is understanding is how will this car be understood in the dealer network? Because that's such a huge part of the communication of the brand to the customer, as much as we think that's a big part of what we do as an OEM, it's really, a, it's, it's, it's done at the dealer level. And so if their experience is great or terrible, it's mostly the dealer. We can make a hundred great commercials. What does that mean? Is it the product itself or the product people you send to the dealer to train? It's, it's what is that? It's the, the, the experience they have at the dealer is either the, the, the product experts or the salesperson. It's the experience they have and how well are they communicating our message that we give to them, via tra whether it's training, uh, whether it's advertising, any of the things that so we've helped them. it's not necessarily the product you're planning. It, it's, it's not necessarily, but you need to understand how well are they going to be able to deliver that message. Because as a product person, we're very passionate about all the, the special features and the, the, all the wonderful things in our car. Mm. You have to understand how much is absorbable at the dealer level in order to be able to communicate that to a customer. It's no secret that the dealer level, you get people, s some people are into cars at a dealer level, but they're mainly yeah. salespeople. They're yeah. transactional. Yeah. The What's an example of something that fell flat to the dealers? Gosh, th there are, uh, let me think about that. There, There's, I think, you got, well, hey, it, it's funny, for many years, uh, I think about the usability of our vehicles. And and I think, if I think the head unit's gotten a thousand times better, I think it's actually pretty good. Oh, dude, I missed, I missed the Becker days. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, well, the radio that was well, in this car? Yeah, we, now, we, this was very easy. In between, though, yeah. uh, I, and I think every manufacturer went through this, we had head units that were a little bit different in every car. Yeah. And I think for, for sometimes that, that manufacturers make the error of saying, well, if we just train them enough, they'll understand it. No. And they won't. And it comes back to the first one. Who's your customer? Is your customer my dad? Yeah. Is it my sister, who are wonderful people, but they don't, they just, the car's pretty, and they're good. And, and so it's not about how it sounds or feels, it's just, wow, I love the way this wood looks on my shift knob. It, it's, it's funny that those are the kind of things they focus on, and I think separating the, the product from what really matters. And, yeah. and, you know, and then you get back to the dealer level, and it's, what can I expect them to be able to reasonably communicate knowing that, hey, uh, you know, salespeople are, like you said, some are really into cars and are amazing at it. And, and fortunately, a luxury brand like Mercedes has just has better people because we're, they, they earn more on a car. And so we, you typically graduate up to a luxury brand as a salesperson. So the luxury we have is that they're going to be better, they're going to be more experienced. And, and so we can rely on that mm -hmm. and know that things that the messages that we want, let's say, repeated at the dealer level, it's happening. And, and oftentimes, they're teaching us things about the customer. Okay, so let's go back to your product planning days in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I already asked you for a couple of examples of something that didn't pass the muster of the whole table, the mm -hmm. different people that came to the table. Give me an example of something that might have not penciled, but you fought for, and it actually made it to market. Whether it's the whole car or one aspect of a car. Yeah, you know, I've, I've got a fun example of that. Obviously, we're always clamoring for more SUVs, and, and SUVs in any shape and size are, are going to win in the, in the North American market, USA or Canada. We had a, a great relationship with the, with the SUV team in Germany, and when the discussion came up for an SUV coupe, 
and and of course, you know, some people say uh, it's blasphemous. You're taking the this and this and this, and you're smashing it together. And how will that work? Well, hey, clearly you see them; they they're everywhere now. Um, but w- I remember uh, we had an opportunity to drive an early, uh, let's say, a production mule, uh, and it was a it was a previous gen. Uh, it was a, back in the M class days. It was uh, before the car was even launched. But they had they said we've put the suspension in it. We've we've changed the weight balance. We've done everything. We want you to drive this car. And and we drove it, and it was absolutely, it was amazing. And they were like, have we gone too far? We think it's too, uh, we, we think it's a little too aggressive. We think it's, uh, you know, is it, is, it, is, it, is the steering too sharp? Do we hear the engine too much? And it, it, was, it was one of those because it was such a U.S. thing. We needed it to be expressive. You can't have this really cool design without having some engine noise and, and slightly sharper steering. And, and so it was one of those where we went really back and forth driving the car, talking about it, and really pushing to say, guys, you haven't gone too far. You, it's it's perfect. And, and with their concern... And who are you talking to? You're talking to the designers, the engineers... A product manager. Yeah, it was. Who, who you talking? Th- this was. Uh, I'll never forget. It's on the test track uh, in, in uh, right in. Uh, Uter- uh, excuse me, in Uttertürkheim and also in uh, Sindelfingen, and so we had an opportunity to take this car out with the the project lead. And again, it was it was just they they had really pushed it to the very limit because that's what we had asked for. We said, guys, we need uh, we need a, a, a car which is expressive, uh, has the has the exhaust sound, has all those things. And this was really we have to think back. We, you know, we didn't have uh, exhaust systems that popped when you pulled off. Th- those just didn't exist back then. So to so to be arguing and pushing for things like that was was a big effort. And to get it, uh, I feel like that really opened the door. For, for us to get more expressive and, and aggressive and just more, I don't know, more passionate s- cars in, into the market. Um, because I, as, as a brand, Mercedes-Benz was something really great, but it wasn't really known for, I think, AMG and, and having cars that were, I think, as aggressive as they are today. So are we saying that the, the, the GLE 63S, which I remember driving in Austria many mm-hmm. years ago, I think you were there, um, that came up. That didn't pencil, but you guys kind you of know, pushed it through and made it work. It, it, it the the car itself penciled, but it di- it would. I don't feel like the the GLE coupe would have ever been as as um, expressive and and what it is without really a strong U.S. influence there. Without Bart's uncle's well, test or whatever. And, and again, and, and I never want to take, it wasn't me, it was a lot of people. And it was just, it was having those great relationships where they would trust us. Yeah. And again, that's because we had a big seat at the table. It's a car for our market. So it, it, they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, other markets so much. Yeah. And we said, guys, we need the biggest, we, we need bigger wheels. We need this, we need that. And they're like, oh, I'm not sure we can do this one. And I was like, figure it out. Uh, and if it costs a little more money, you've got to change the fender well around. Do it. Let's see if we can do it. Let's see what it costs. If we need to add a little bit to the price, it, it will work. And uh, that's one of those where you can do all the testing you want, but it comes back to the relationships that you have. And that was a relationship we really leaned on. Fortunately, we had a big seat at the table, and, and, it, and it worked out really well. So it cost you money and time, but because you would be the one of the biggest customers, they took you seriously. Exactly. Exactly. B- true or false? It, 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 it's, is it a good thing to not be all things to all people? It absolutely is. You cannot be all things to all people. And does that pencil out? It, it definitely does. Because I really do feel like if you try to spread yourself too thin to everyone, you end up being nothing. Okay. Put this in order of top three. Design, the way the car drives, or price. What, how, what order would you put those in? Mm. Design. People see it first. I would agree completely. Yeah, and you eat with your eyes. I, I have said this for <laughs> years, and now I've got somebody who's been doing this 24 years to back <laughs> me up. Okay, so design number one. What's number two? Uh, how it drives. So, so price really is number three? I, I think if you get the first two right, the, the price you're able to get. That's quite a bombshell. <laughs> I was totally <laughs> well. expecting you to go twice price number two. Yeah, no, hey, expecting it. I think price is one thing, but if you're trying, it, it, as a brand, we're not trying to, we're not a car for the masses. And I think you have to get the first two right. Okay. Follow up, true or false? That number one design mm-hmm. transcends all cars? Mm. All segments? Not necessarily. I think as you become a little bit more utilitarian, uh, there's different tastes. Okay. Okay, so you haven't been on the show in a while. So you, you haven't seen it the way we end these episodes. Mm-hmm. We like to turn them around to the audience to okay. get feedback. And these Great. guys, 
They are very, very vocal, and they would probably be more vocal with you because you literally have your finger on the button to make things happen or <laughs> for not For better happen. or for worse, yeah. Like, yeah. this is the guy. Yeah, yeah. And he's going <laughs> to, pretty soon... So, sorry if there's something that, you know, didn't happen, but let me know. This guy's on his way to being the emperor of all of well. Mercedes. <laughs> So we will get that brown diesel manual station wagon with floor seats and rolled out windows once yep. you're the boss. <laughs> so what feedback do you want from the audience? I, I, hey, I, I think it would be really interesting to see uh, you know, what do they think about the products they're seeing now and how does, and, and I think we talked about this a little bit earlier just off camera, What what's a, because you know, I'm sure the performance cars are always interesting and, and this is a passionate group. How do they see performance mixing with electric? Good question. You know, Christoph was on the show. He's the man. He's the boss yeah. of all electric. Yeah, yeah. He didn't ask that question. Okay. You know, okay. we're going to beat him up next time you see him. <laughs> Are you coming to, to drive the, the EQS SUV in Denver? Uh, no, I don't think I'll be there. Okay, so I'll miss you there, but I'll okay. be there. Okay, if, if Starzinski's there, ask, you can ask him. Okay. Tell him I said hello. I will. I will Great guy. That. Okay, so for the avoidance of doubt, how do they, what do they feel about the product now, mm -hmm. and how do they think of the mashup mm -hmm. of performance yeah and ev yeah okay you heard what the man said let us know in the comments below or via our social media moto man tv all word moto man tv on facebook twitter and instagram and with that want to leave you with something a little bit behind the scenes we are in claremont mm -hmm. ontario canada right now this is uh, moto man headquarters north mm -hmm. uh, otherwise known as pacioni's garage <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> this is his girlfriend's car behind us and when you turned up, it was pissing down rain. Yes, yes. And you turned up in a baby buggy. Yeah. yeah. However, <laughs> when you got out of your baby buggy, you had an umbrella. And look at this umbrella handle. It is the shift knob of a 300 SL. Yes. If this guy doesn't have class, I don't know who well, does. Well, you're, you're very kind, and I appreciate it. Sir, thank you for coming up. Thank you. Till we see you in the next episode, bish beta.